Hi everybody, I'm Dr. Deed Harrison. I'm president of Chiropractic Biophysics Technique and Seminars, and I'm also president of Chiropractic Biophysics Nonprofit, a Spinal Research Foundation. What we've been doing is presenting a weekly video where I go through one of CBP Nonprofit's spine research publications. Uh, we have about 150 plus spine research peer-reviewed publications out there, and what we're doing is going through each one in a video format. This week, we have our 18th video in the series, and this is one of our clinical control trials on extension compression traction to restore the cervical curve in chronic neck pain populations that have a loss of their cervical curve. Last week, we presented another one of our trials on cervical traction. This week, is a follow-up to that in a second clinical control trial that we've done on this type of cervical compression extension three-point bending traction. So without further ado, let's go through this. Uh, this particular project was published in 2003 in the Journal of Manipulative and Physiological Therapeutics. It is the number one chiropractic research journal out there. Uh, this was uh, in volume 26, page 139 through 151. The title of the project was Increasing the Cervical Lordosis with Chiropractic Biophysics Seated Combined Extension Compression and Transverse Load Cervical Traction with Spinal Manipulation, a non-randomized clinical control trial. This is the type of traction we're talking about in this particular project. This is different than last week's traction. Last week's traction, the back pole was slightly elevated upwards or straight backwards. This time we have a, full, a pole on the forehead that's going straight down, adding compression load to the cervical spine. The goal of this project is to see, is this able to restore the cervical curve? Is it better than the previous type of traction in selected cases? and does it assist with chronic neck pain? These are our study hypotheses and tested uh, uh, particular aspects of the project. Uh, this uh, particular study, we have a, uh, a cohort of prospective uh, selected patients that chose to do the traction treatment and also a prospective co cohort that is matched for the condition of chronic neck pain and chose to do what we call self-selected uh, self-treatment, essentially the same thing that they were doing before the start of the project. Uh, what we did is we ended up with 30 prospective uh, chronic neck pain subjects that had loss of the cervical curve that were in the uh, treatment group. Also, in the treatment group, in addition to the traction, we apply a diversified style of chiropractic spinal adjusting or chiropractic spinal manual manipulative therapy. Uh, this was applied for the first two to four weeks of the study project. Then we also did cervical extension two-way traction. This was applied every single day for a total of 38 sessions over the course of 14 weeks. So not quite, not quite, three times a week, just shy of that, okay? So we're looking at almost three times a week for uh, 14 weeks, okay? Also in the treatment group, we also did warm-up extension exercises into their active range of motion. I'll show you what we mean by that. So in the first two to four weeks, every subject got chiropractic spinal manipulative therapy to the cervical spine. Every visit, they also got cervical warm-up extension exercises. Every visit, they also got this new type of traction. We compared this to a sample a cohort of self-selected control subjects, 33 subjects with chronic neck pain and loss of the cervical lordosis, opted to be in the control group. These subjects, we had an initial examination, and then 8.5 months later, we had a second examination. These subjects received no care. They self-selected in a non-randomized fashion into the control group. Outcome measures, cervical curve, segmental and total angles of curve on the x-ray, as well as numerical rating score for neck chronic neck pain. We also followed the treatment group subjects for another 15 uh, months, or excuse me, 14 months. At the end of the 38 sessions in the treatment subjects, these subjects stopped care, were placed on a maintenance care program, so they were uh, suggested or recommended to come in once a month or once every other month 
for the duration of this uh, 14 or 15 month follow-up. Okay. Now, 21 of the 30 subjects, or 70%, made it to the long-term follow-up. We had a nine subject or 30% dropout. The average in these subjects, in terms of the number of visits, was just over, just over, once every two months, okay? Or just under once every two months. So the, these subjects came in for periodic maintenance over the course of this 14 month follow up. Now, if you remember last week's project, we did no care over the course of the follow up. And those subjects uh, lost about 25% uh, of the cervical curve uh, correction. And most of that loss was in the uh, top few neck joints, skull to C2. This time we're looking at what is a, a, a recommended maintenance care follow up period, what does that do to the stability of the correction over time? Here's the angles that we're looking at on the x-ray. We're looking at the total angles of curve. We're looking at the segmental angles of curve. Of interest, we're more interested in number C here, or letter C, sorry. Uh, the ARA C2 to C7 posterior body lines, the back of the body of C2 and the back of the body of C7. That's really classically the way chiropractic biophysics practitioners and leaders, that's the way we analyze the cervical curve. It's a more valid representation of how much curve you actually have. Okay, so we're interested in letter C and then the segmental angles shown in letter D as well as the atlas plane line shown in E and the uh, translation distances shown in F. Now, if you recall, these lines, we previously established that these are reliable lines. So now we can use these as part of a clinical control trial. We know that these are, are reliable. We know from session A to session B, we are consistent. So if we see a change, that change is due to what we've done. Okay, so compression two-way. We've gotta be careful when we use this with subjects. Now, none of our subjects in the treatment group have true disc herniation, they don't have canal stenosis, they don't have foraminal stenosis, they don't have radiculopathy. So we have a, a group of subjects that it's safe to do extension compression traction with. Now when you do this type of backwards bending, if somebody has what's called a space occupying lesion in their cervical canal, foraminal or central, you have to be very careful with doing hyperextension compression traction. Okay, so there is a screening process for this. This is why we do exams and x-rays. This is why we don't just work on somebody and stick you in traction without doing a proper exam and x-ray. Okay? We have indications and contraindications for this. Okay? So we know that not everybody that comes through our doors is a candidate for this type of traction. There are other procedures that we would do for somebody that had a disc herniation, stenosis, and radiculopathy. Again, these subjects do not have that. So how we start a subject, we start a subject seated with the front pole pulling forward at the apex of their abnormal cervical curve. Then we add only the weight of their head going backwards. In other words, we have no back weight. Shown here is back weight. When we start somebody, we don't have back weight pulling the head down and, and backwards. It's just the weight of their head. Once a subject can do that, for up to 10 minutes with no issues. No issues means they don't have an increase in their neck pain. They're comfortable in this position. Then we start adding weight to the back pole on the forehead. Ideally, the average subject, we need to get them to a minimum of 10 minutes of sustained traction positioning. Better to go up to 20 minutes. Ideally, the minimum subject needs to have 15 pounds on the front and about seven to eight pounds on the back. In other words, we use roughly a two to one weight ratio. Not perfectly in some cases, but it's close to that. It's all based on subject's flexibility, subject's tolerance, and the subject's initial sagittal plane cervical curve alignment and their head posture. Okay, so we have to be careful when we manage people with this, but doctors were trained in this. This is what we do in chiropractic biophysics. We work people into this position. Eventually, people are going to get up to where they can do at least 20 minutes or 10 to 20 minutes of this with at least uh, about seven to eight pounds on the back and 15 on the front. It's better to get closer to 10 to 12 pounds on the back and 20 to 24 pounds on the front pole, okay? And if a patient can go up a little bit higher, that's great. 
Smaller frame men and women likely can't go above that. Uh, larger frame men and women can actually go a little bit higher. Again, it's always at the patient's tolerance. Okay, warm up extension exercises. This was actually done prior to the traction. Most people spend their day in a hunched forward or bent forward head position. Back when this trial was done, people didn't have their damn cell phones that they were texting on. They were sitting at a computer or driving cars or whatever it was. Nowadays, people are doing this, texting with their neck forward, so people are spending a lot of time throughout the day with their head bent forward. That's not a healthy position. It takes out the curve, makes the head go forward, makes the shoulders round. Why do you think you're getting neck pain and headaches and lightheadedness and all kinds of problems? It's because of what you're doing with your body every day. So knowing that, if people haven't spent any time bending their head and neck backwards, you cannot just have them come in and say, oh, get in this traction. You have to warm them up. You have to get the tissues flexible. You have to get them to maneuver into the extension position. So if you look at this figure, we did a neutral position with them standing up against the wall with a block. We then actively had them extend their head and translate it backwards. No resistance, just to warm up and increase the flexibility. You can also take the shoulders when they're rolled forward and you can retract or pull them backwards by pulling the shoulder blades together and externally rotating the glenohumeral joint. Okay, that's an acceptable thing to do. We do several minutes of this or you can work a patient up to 30 to 50 repetitions. Now ideally you might want to add resistance to this. In this project we did not want to add resistance because we wanted to see what the traction did without resistive exercises. Only a warm-up flexibility maneuver was performed. Here's our group comparisons. We're looking at the treatment group and the control group. We're seeing are they properly matched. So look the age. These subjects are matched for age. Here's the control group, 37. Here's the treatment group, 36. Standard deviation, approximately the same. P-value greater than 0.05, no difference in the two groups for age. Height, they are matched for height. Weight, they are matched for weight. Pain, they are matched for initial pain. However, the post-pain, the control group, look at this. Eight and a half months later, they have nearly the exact same pain level, chronic neck pain. The treatment group subjects are 75% better. Now, I covered this last time, but I'm going to say it again. You know what? We have to do a study to look at the natural history of our group and look at does chronic neck pain go away on its own? That's one of the reasons we have a control group. The other reason is, does the cervical curve abnormality, does it get better on its own? We're gonna look at that in the next slide coming up. But what we see here is chronic pain. If you have chronic neck pain and you do nothing for it, it's gonna be there eight months later. This is a terrible thing for people that have chronic pain. This is frustrating to them. This is challenging for them. They, they are really done suffering. They don't know what to do. But some people, they look at this and they go, well, there's no hope for me. I doubt this can work. I'm going to go in the control group. Blows my mind when you do a, a self-selected, non-randomized trial that some people would choose to do nothing. Maybe they are seeing if it will just go away on its own. But you know what? Look what we found. It, it doesn't go away on its own. You know, it does not go away. But you look at the treatment group, you look at this, at our initial post-evaluation after 38 sessions, they're 75% improved. That's a big deal. That's a big change in these people. If you look at what we did, we've improved chronic neck pain 75% in 38 sessions. Okay, control group, looking at their lateral cervical x-ray measurements. Does the curve stay the same from session A, initial exam, to session B, 8.5 months later? This is translation of the top of the neck, C1 to T1. How far is the top of the neck in front of the bottom? Look, 23 millimeters initially, 21 millimeters at long-term follow-up. That's no change statistically. That's within the ability to make the measurement and of a subject to repeat the position. Same thing with C2 to C7, just another measurement. You can see almost identical. Atlas plane line to horizontal. That means the top of the neck, how it's tilted relative to the horizon. 15 and 16, no difference. Anything within one to two degrees, that's not different. C2 to C3, the same. C3 to C4, you go all the way down the total angle of curve, 10 degree curve. 
11 degree curve. It doesn't change on its own. Now a 10 degree curve, what is normal? Well, most studies will say you have to be at least in the mid 20s and up. Otherwise, you have a risk of having chronic neck pain. These subjects are dramatically reduced in their cervical curvature. They have 10 degrees for their average. Okay? We want to see something minimum of 25 degrees, better yet closer to 30 to 40 degrees if that person's anatomy dictates that. Okay? So these are true hypolordotic loss of the cervical curvature in these subjects. No wonder they have chronic neck pain. No wonder the neck pain didn't change in eight and a half months. The curve doesn't look any better. It has nothing to do with a muscle spasm. Muscles don't spasm for eight months. They don't. Okay? It's not because you had neck pain that your curve looks like this. It's the other way around. Your curve, being abnormal, came from either an accident, an injury, or some bad habits that you've consistently done over your life. It's not because your muscles are spasmed. Muscles don't spasm for eight and a half years, it doesn't ha or eight and a half months. It doesn't happen. Okay? So keep that in mind. It's the loss of the neck curve itself causing the neck pain. That's our perspective. Treatment group. You look at this from a treatment group point of view, 38 sessions. We have an initial examination. We treat them 38 sessions with two to four weeks of spinal manipulative therapy, extension exercises to warm them up, and our new extension compression traction. Okay. Now, after that 38 visits, we wait a minimum of 24 hours and then we repeat an examination and x-ray. Many of the subjects it was 72 hours later. So let's look at their change in their cervical curve. We already know it made them feel 75 percent better with their chronic neck pain intensity. Let's look at the curve. Let's start at the top, the translation. Look at this, 50 percent better. Started at 24 millimeters down to 12 millimeters. That's a big change. If you change your head posture by a half an inch, that takes a load off the spine muscles and tissues. That decreased load takes uh, pressure and, and uh, uh, decreases pain responses in the cervical spine tissues. Your cervical spine tissues are load sensitive. Your head goes forward, you increase the load. You bring the head backwards, you uh, you decrease the load. We know this in mechanics of the spine. We know it. My group, we've done research on that. Look at the Atlas plane line. 10 degrees up to 21 degrees. That's a big change. Look at the segmental angles. All the segmental angles with a uh, borderline, actually this one is still a change, but it's a borderline change. This one only changed 2.4 degrees, but it's still a statistically significant change. You look at all the, the uh, segmental angles, they have a change. The total angle of curve, C2 to C7, 17.9 degrees. That's huge. That is the largest ever reported conservative care correction in a clinical trial of the cervical curve ever reported. It is the largest value ever done. Almost 18 degrees. Why? It's the type of traction that we're doing. This traction is specifically designed to increase the neck curve. Also because we added warm up extension exercises, this likely increases the flexibility and makes the traction more effective. Okay. 18 degrees as our mean value. Now, of course, there's a standard deviation in these subjects. Okay, I didn't report the standard deviation, I just couldn't fit all the data. You can go to the paper here. However, the average is very high. There's some subjects that change a little less than that, some that change a little bit more, but this is a very high mean average, the largest ever reported. Did I say that? I'll say it again. Age comparison. You know, people say, oh, you know, I'm too old for this. Well, when we look at our subjects that are above and below the mean age, we find that age doesn't play a role in this population. Okay, there's no difference in subjects below 36 and above 36 with their correction, with their improvements, okay? Then we have our long-term follow-up. What happens when we stop active care after 38 visits and we do once a month or once every other month of a treatment where we do the same therapies again. So we do extension traction with warm-up exercises and then we also adjust the segments of the spine like chiropractors do. What happens when we do that over the course of 15 months or excuse me 14 months. I keep saying 15 that was the last project that we did uh, previous week. Okay look at this. Here's what we have identified. This is their correction x-ray at 38 after 38 visits 
compared to their long-term follow-up. There's no statistically significant change in these values, meaning my curve correction has stayed stable. Now we only have 70% of these subjects coming back. So we don't know what happened to the other 30%, but in the 70% that came back, it looks like a limited amount of chiropractic maintenance or supportive care is needed to maintain true stable correction. Our other project, if you remember last week, we lost 25% of our correction. This time we're seeing no loss in the correction in our group that returned. This is very important. This is why chiropractors will do supportive care or maintenance care. You can't just stop and go back to exactly what you did. You might lose a little bit of that correction. It's no different than you know proper dietary modifications. Change your lifestyle, right? No different than exercise. If you continue to exercise, you maintain the results. It's no different than dental care. If you continue to take care of your teeth, then your dental checkups are good. But you know what, if you don't, then bad things happen, right? So this is what we've done in this project. We're like, hey, let's look at what chiropractic supportive care on a limited basis, what that does. Now this does not mean this is all you need. There's some people that need more than once a month or more than once every other month. You've got to take this on a case by case basis. In this project though, what we identified is that this minimum maintenance care, supportive care regimen was effective at sta stabilizing the curve correction and the pain improvements, by the way. Study results, the control group, just to repeat. No differences were found in the control group subjects, pain scores and cervical curves doesn't change on its own, you gotta do something about it. You can't just sit there and go, oh, you know what, it's gonna get better on its own. Chronic pain doesn't get better on its own. You know what, a study came out in 2005 out of the journal Pain. This came out of a, uh, out of a, uh, a Finnish population. One of the largest studies ever done. Thousands of Finnish medical, metal workers, metal workers. They identified 25 years later the majority of subjects still had chronic back and leg pain at, compared to the initial evaluation 25 years later. That's really terrible. You know, how's that, you know, you look at a patient and you go, I'm sorry, you're gonna suffer for the next 25 years. That's terrible to wanna say to somebody, but if you don't do proper things, pain will not get better on its own. And I'm talking about chronic pain. I'm not talking about, oh, you just, you know, injured yourself, you know, chopping a quarter wood or whatever it is and you got acute muscle pain or acute joint pain. I'm talking about true chronic pain. It doesn't typically go away on its own, okay? Our results show the same thing. Conversely, in the treatment group, we showed 75% improvement in their chronic neck pain intensity. We did that, I believe, because, or we found that, I believe, because we improved the cervical curve. Here's a subject that started with a reverse cervical curve. This is called a cervical kyphosis. Your neck curve is going the wrong way. It's not supposed to go this direction. Look at this. The teeth would be up here. Okay, here's the top of the neck, the base of the skull. This is called C1 or the atlas. This is two and we number them all the way down. Look at the disc between five and six and six and seven. That disc is squashed. The disc is the space between the bone. It's a cartilaginous cushion, if you will. It's a load transmitter. It's a hydraulic mechanism. When that disc degenerates, you lose that hydraulic transmission and now you start to get disc degeneration and bone spurs and things like that, okay? This is a reverse cervical curve. This is not a good position for your neck to be in. There's nothing in the front of the neck to support this load, so it squashes the disc and the bone. You have your trachea and your esophagus up there. Those are not load-bearing structures. Those are soft tissues. You have to have a cervical curve to load the posterior aspects of the spine. A reverse cervical curve is very, very bad for people. It is not good, okay? Obviously, this woman's had this for a long time and, and she has disc degeneration, so we know that, okay? Now, this is a 10 week follow up. Remember the average was 14. Some of the subjects got an earlier follow up. Look at the difference in the cervical curvature on the post x-ray. This is a well maintained cervical curve or this is a, a well corrected cervical curve. We want to maintain this now, right? Look at the disc spaces. They've opened up. You can't make this up, okay? You can't fake this on an x-ray. 
This is a true correction. The curve has changed. The disc has opened up. No wonder she feels better, right? By the way, this was a female patient. Here's somebody that we had the initial, the 10 week follow up, and then a seven month uh, follow up. Now remember, the average follow up of uh, these subjects was just over, uh, it was just over 14 months. Some of the subjects though, we got them in a little bit early, okay? So for every you know, follow up time period, which you have to realize the mean, there's a standard deviation. So this subject was a seven month follow up, not a 14 month sub, uh, follow up. What do you notice? We notice a really nice curve correction in their neck. A straight column has been changed to a nice cervical curve and at follow up, that's maintained, okay? Conclusions. Our new three-point bending cervical extension compression traction in 30 cervical chronic pain subjects. We found statistically significant changes in pain, 75% by the way, and lateral cervical x-ray measurements, 18 degrees almost in C2 to C7, and statistically significant difference all the way down. There was no change in 33 chronic neck pain control subjects. The average cervical curve stayed the same in that group. The average pain intensity stayed the same. Okay, by the way, this is a little typo in the control subjects. That should be for the treatment group. At long-term follow-up, 14 months average in 70% of the treatment group, the improvements were mostly stable after as little as one session every one to two months. Okay? This is a very important clinical control trial. It builds on the previous week's trial. This is a, a unique type of traction. Again, there's indications and contraindications for it. But what it shows, in as little as 14 weeks, 38 sessions, we can change chronic neck pain by 75%. We can also change the cervical curve. And we believe that that's the reason why they improve their chronic neck pain intensity. Future projects have to actually test that particular part of the hypothesis. But we know this. We know by putting a patient through a program of our corrective care with chiropractic biophysics, we know the average person will improve with their chronic neck pain by 75%. And we know the average person doing this type of traction when they're selected right for it will dramatically improve their cervical curvature. We also know at long-term follow-up just over a year with doing just a little bit of supportive care, that correction is maintained. Okay, hopefully, hopefully you've enjoyed this week's uh, video presentation of one of our research publications for CBP Nonprofit. Please consider the end message that I have for you, and uh, I hope to have you uh, continue to watch these videos and support Chiropractic Biophysics Nonprofit and Chiropractic Biophysics Seminars and Techniques. Thank you very much. I like this information, if you're a patient, you need to go to a chiropractic biophysics trained chiropractor. You can find us all over the United States, Canada, and international locations. Go to www.cbppatient.com and look up CBP providers in your area. It's an easy to use, uh, user friendly site. Search for, at first, a general or advanced trained CBP chiropractor. If you can't find one of those, then find somebody that's at least on the directory and has taken our courses and that does the work, okay? So let's go to a CBP trained chiropractor, www.cbppatient.com. If you're a chiropractor and you're interested in this, either learning more about it or maybe it's brand new to you and this you know, particular video research project intrigues you, come to our website, for doctors go to idealspine.com we've got a lot of things there for you we've got training we've got conferences we've got products love to have you on board and become one of the CBP doctor family providers right we need your help there's patients out there that need you and if you don't get trained in this work then you're not going to be able to provide them the type of service that we think you should be providing them from a corrective care point of view also lastly anybody out there we also need your help to continue to do research investigations like this, right? These are time and dollar consuming projects. If you will, go to our web uh, site directly and sponsor and support Chiropractic Biophysics Nonprofit. Make a donation of any amount to us. Also, you can do it indirectly on Amazon Smile. Just select Chiropractic Biophysics as your nonprofit foundation. And when you purchase through Amazon Smile and Amazon, CBP Nonprofit will get a half a percent of all your purchases, which is a big deal that adds up. 